Hey students, welcome to Sustainable Energy. I'm Rudy Schlaf, a professor at the Electrical Engineering Department at USF. In part one we will first discuss the uh, physical background of bioenergy and then we will discuss direct combustion and gasification of biofuels. Let's start with the definition of bioenergy. Bioenergy summarizes essentially all energy that is derived from solar energy and stored in living matter. This living matter is also known as biomass. So the photons from the sun are being absorbed in plants. The plants grow and create biomass. The animals eat the plants and the animals grow and so they also become biomass. If you think of fossil fuels, they are basically old biomass. These are derived from plants that over time were processed into oil and coal and so forth. Like fossil fuels, biomass can be burnt directly. That is the easiest way to use it. Very widespread use is for cooking food. Heating, of course, is very straightforward. And we can make electrical power by using a heat engine in combination with a generator. Essentially the same setup like for fossil fuels. Another way to use biomass is to convert it into standardized biofuels. The most popular ones right now are methanol, ethanol, biodiesel and charcoal. The advantage of this approach is that standardized fuels have the advantage that one can build machines for them that are optimized for the particular fuel type and that increases the efficiency. The disadvantage is that here is the word converting and by now you know that every time we convert a type of energy into another type we lose some energy to the environment by generating heat loss. Here are some interesting numbers about bioenergy. The first one to consider is the energy stored as biomass per time. That is 95 terawatts. So that is our total bio power supply that we have on this planet. 95 terawatts power output. This contrasts with 18 terawatts of total worldwide primary energy use per time. So this is the world power supply that currently supports humanity. So this is a number of 2010. I took that from this graph published by the Energy Information Administration. And so I estimated here from this graph the terawatt hours for 2010. And then I divided by the number of hours in one year. And that gives the 18 terawatts approximately. So out of these 18 terawatts, 1.6 terawatts are already being derived from biomass. We will see later that most of this goes into cooking food in the developing world. The energy that is consumed as food by 6.2 billion people, that's a number from 2002, that is 0.5 terawatts. If you divide 0.5 terawatts by 6.2 billion people, then you arrive at about 81 watts per person. So this means if you put 20 person in a room, then this room is being heated like with a space heater that has 1,600 watts approximately. Another fact to consider is the total sun power reaching the Earth, which is 1.74 times 10 to the 17 watts. So this is 174,000 terawatts. So compare this with the biomass that is being generated. This means that only about 0.05% of the energy from the sun is actually converted to biomass, to bioenergy. This already tells us that plants are terrible energy converters that have a very, very low efficiency. So what is going on during photosynthesis? Essentially photosynthesis converts carbon dioxide to sugar and it makes oxygen in the process. The photons from the sun come in and they are being absorbed in the thylakoids inside the chloroplast and the energy of the photons is used to split water molecules that come through the roots uh, into the plant into oxygen which is emitted to the environment, that's what we're breathing, and high energetic protons and these protons 
they are then used to convert low energy adenosine diphosphate ADP to high energy adenosine triphosphate. So we're making a molecule that has more energy and this ATP is then used as fuel essentially in the Kelvin cycle that converts the carbon dioxide that the plant takes in to sugars. So here this is the Kelvin cycle and the chloroplast releases sugar. These sugars are used for making glucose and sucrose, starch and other carbohydrates that finally make up the plant. So this is the biomass that is produced during this process. It was no coincidence that on the previous slide the two photons that were absorbed in the schematic were one red and one blue. The reason for that is that photosynthesis mostly occurs with red and with blue photons while green photons are mostly ignored by this process. This is the reason why plants look green because the green light is simply being reflected. Plants mostly absorb the red and the blue components of the spectrum. Here you see an absorption spectrum of chlorophyll A, the most important molecule participating in the photosynthetic process. Here you see a schematic of this molecule, so it's a fairly complicated biomolecule. So this molecule has the purple absorption spectrum. And you see here, this is the, on the wavelength scale. So on this side we have blue at 400 nanometers and here at about 600-700 nanometers. That is the red range of the spectrum. If you wonder how to convert that uh, into electron volts, here is the equation. But you have to put the wavelengths in microns in there. Okay, so this is the absorption spectrum and we see there's only a significant absorption in the red and in the blue range of the spectrum. And if you look at the photosynthetic activity associated with wavelengths, you get the green curve. So they measured that by exposing the plants to light of a specific color and then measuring how much oxygen came from the plant that yielded this green spectrum. And so you see that there is a pretty good correlation between photosynthetic activity and this absorption spectrum. So this really shows that green light is not participating in photosynthesis. It is ignored by plants. The reason for that is these molecules are sensitive to light damage. Therefore, plants try to reduce the number of photons that are interacting with these molecules. By reflecting green, which is the highest intensity part of the solar spectrum, this is accomplished very effectively. The downside of this is, of course, that the rate at which biomass is being produced is much lower than it could be if the green light were used. But we need to keep in mind here that plants do not exist to make as much biomass as possible. They simply try to survive and to reproduce, so it's not their main focus. It's interesting to consider that the minimum photosynthesis wavelength is here in the red range. If the wavelength is longer than red, then photosynthesis drops again. This indicates already that photosynthesis is a one band gap conversion process, so it's similar to a single junction solar cell. This means that if the plant absorbs blue photons, this energy that is above the wavelength of the red absorption peak, that is again energy that is lost to heat, similar to what happened in solar cells when the photon energy was larger than the band gap. Here's the energy diagram of this process. So we have here on the y-axis the energy and these two lines are the low energy state and the high energy state. That's called here lowest excited state and the low energy state is the ground state. So we're trying to look at this as it were a solar cell and in many ways it is. So we have this band gap of 1.8 electron volts. This corresponds to the red absorption peak of the chlorophyll that we just saw at uh, 680 nanometers. And this band gap, of course, now determines part of our conversion efficiency. So you know now that all the light that has a larger energy, this part of the energy that's above the band gap that is being lost as heat, light that is below the band gap is not being absorbed at all, doesn't participate in photosynthesis. And then once we have the electron hole pairs, the electron is here in the excited state and down here a hole is being left. 
So this is essentially the water splitting process. After that we have to separate and make the ATP molecules and this is this process. So here in this process we go from this 1.8 electron volt energy difference after the water was split to 1.1 electron volt difference that drives the synthesis of the sugars. So here at this energy carbon dioxide is being processed into sugars. And so you see that of all this big photon energy that we may have had very little remains here that is then used for making sugars. All this added together is a big part of the reason that plants have only a less than 1% efficiency for photovoltaic energy conversion. This graph summarizes the loss factors on the way from photon energy to biomass. So we come in here with photons and then this little bit of the energy that is actually going into biomass and potentially into the tank of a vehicle as they assume here. So we have these five major loss factors. On the previous slide we just talked about the internal conversion loss that is the excess photon energy above the band gap that is lost to heat and this arrow here that is called NADPH plus ATP. This stands for the energy loss during the synthesis process of the energy molecules that are being used for the carbon dioxide to sugar conversion. When ATP is made and the other molecule NADPH, we didn't mention that on the previous slide, these two molecules, they are synthesized at 1.1 electron volts. So after the light is absorbed at 1.8. Once the electrons and holes are separated in the solar cell, only 1.1 eV are being actually used for this synthesis process. So these are the two loss factors that we discussed on the previous slide. Additional loss factors are regulatory dissipation. So regulatory dissipation, that is the phenomenon that if there is more light than the plant can actually use for uh, sugar production, the energy of this light is simply dissipated as heat and therefore does not contribute to biomass production. This appears to be the largest loss factor. Then there is carbon dioxide assimilation, that is this arrow. This means that the process that makes sugar from carbon dioxide can also work in the opposite direction while costing energy. So the plant also emits carbon dioxide. It doesn't only absorb it for sugar production. This is of course also a loss to biomass production. And then the final loss factor is growth and maintenance. We should keep in mind that plants are organisms, so they have to survive and that means that costs energy. So some of the energy that is coming into the plant doesn't go into making the plant bigger, uh, producing biomass. It is simply used for the plant to survive and reproduce. Adding all these losses together brings us to an efficiency that is far below 1% in most plants. This table lists the energy conversion efficiency of a few biofuel plants. The top rows give the efficiencies of these plants and then we have a comparison to microalgae and to silicon based photovoltaic cells. Now if you look at the plant efficiencies, they are all much smaller than 1%. This confirms the discussion on the previous slides that plants are very poor energy converters. We need to keep in mind though that for these numbers, the efficiency was calculated by comparing the biofuel that was extracted per year from one hectare of land compared to the solar energy that was impinging on this area during that same year. These numbers should be compared to solar plant efficiencies and not to solar panel efficiencies. That makes the comparison with the photovoltaic cells that they made slightly flawed. They assumed they could cover this hectare with 80% with solar cells that operate at 18% efficiency, that all is very optimistic. We learned in the solar energy chapter that it seems that most plants operate at about 5% efficiency per area. But still, if you use the 5% number, 5% is two magnitudes larger than most of these numbers that we have for the biofuel plants. This slide shows some prototypical 
molecules that one finds in biomass, we can group them into two principal groups of molecules. On the right side, we have molecules that are precursors to biofuels. There is glucose, we can make alcohol out of this fairly easily. And there is triglyceride, which is the precursor to biodiesel. This can be extracted from soybeans, for example, or algae. On the left side, we have bigger molecules like lignin, hemicellulose, and cellulose. These molecules make up the plant structure, and these molecules are actually quite close to what is found as unconventional fossil fuels. If you remember the molecular structures of bitumen and carrageen, they are quite similar to these molecules. These molecules are best for direct combustion in power plants or for heating purposes. Once the biomass is generated, we need to convert it into useful energy forms that we can use in standardized equipment. What we want is, is heat, electricity or fuel. So we need to convert the biomass into these energy forms. We have two principal ways to do this. One is thermochemical and the other one is biochemical. In thermochemical we use heat and use that either directly to create steam and then use a turbine and a generator so we can make electricity or we can just heat a building etc. Another approach is to use heat to crack the biomolecules into smaller components and then we have as output from these pyrolysis processes we have gaseous, uh, liquid and solid components that we can separate out and these can then be used in various uh, approaches to generate electricity or use them as fuels. The biochemical conversion uses bacteria. The bacteria digest the biomass into useful components and for the case of fermentation this is usually used for sugars to make alcohols, ethanol, out of them. So that's a, a useful fuel. The other route is anaerobic digestion. There the typical output is biogas and this biogas can be used as a fuel and in specialized engines uh, to generate electricity. The only biomass that can be used fairly directly without much processing is uh, oil. So once one has oil plants one can extract the oil and then with little modification use this oil as biodiesel in diesel engines. Direct combustion of biomass accounts for 95% of all global biomass energy use. This is 10% of the total energy use. Most of the biomass that is being combusted is used for cooking. There are about 2.5 billion people that rely on this type of uh, three stone cooking fire, which is fueled by wood or animal waste. The efficiency of this type of stove is only 15%, which is easy to see because a lot of the uh, hot combustion products, they simply escape and they don't transfer well into the uh, food or water that is inside this pot. This can be significantly improved and if you look at these numbers here, 10% of the total energy use, if one could double the efficiency of such stoves, this would make a big difference. Here you see an example of an improved stove, the Pazzari stove. The design is simple but it addresses the two major issues of the open fire. First of all, it provides an enclosure which can create a draft. There is an exhaust at the end. Here we see a cross section. So air comes in from the front and then the fire is here and it heats the plate. The exhaust uh, fumes go into this pipe here at the end. There's a second plate which uses the remaining heat in the exhaust fumes. This plate can be used for keeping food warm or heating water. Because of the enclosed design, the escape of fumes into the kitchen or the house is prevented and this addresses the problem of in-house pollution that is very common with open fires and this reduces the rate of the occurrence of lung cancer and other respiratory illnesses. Here you see some data. They cooked tortilla and they measured how much fuel was used. And so you see that the 
three stone fire uses about twice the amount of fuel than the Pazari stoves. This is a great example how low tech can have a significant impact on energy use. This is a schematic of a typical biofuel power plant. The main differences to conventional coal-fired power plants are in the feeding mechanism which needs to handle biofuels and the combustion chamber design which needs to be optimized for the different properties of biofuels. Once heat is generated, steam is made and the steam drives a turbine and we have a generator that makes electricity. Let's consider the combustion process of biofuels for a moment. Everybody has probably set some wood on fire at some point. When you do that, you hold the match to the wood until it starts turning black and some smoke is coming off. What's happening there is a process called pyrolysis. This means you heat up the surface and when the surface is hot enough, the cellulose molecules break up into small volatile components. Here's a list, non-inclusive, but the most important components perhaps. Methane, methanol, acetic and formic acid, carbon monoxide, uh, hydrogen, to some degree already complete combustion products, carbon dioxide and water. Now we have these gas molecules in the air and the oxygen in the air now readily reacts with these energetic molecules and the temperature rises and when the temperature is higher than 480 degrees then the reaction becomes self-sustaining so the temperature is high enough to evaporate the surface of the wood and feed the combustion process by itself and at that point the wood is essentially on fire the challenge in furnaces is to heat the fuel in such a way that it completely evaporates that we can really combust the entire amount of fuel. If this process is not optimized, particles of non-combusted fuel make it into the exhaust and of course that is energy loss. How well this process works can be observed via the color of the fire. If the fire is orange, that typically means incomplete combustion because soot particles, which are uncombusted fuel particles, they emit black body radiation when they're hot. So the typical temperature of the fire uh, makes them emit orange light. If a fire is efficient and the fuel combusts nearly completely, then one gets an invisible or bluish flame, which means that ultraviolet and blue light is being emitted from individual gas molecules that are the end product of the combustion process. Now we understand that the condition for efficient combustion is to transfer heat to the surface of the fuel efficiently, to heat it up that it breaks up into gas molecules that then can efficiently combust with the oxygen that is in the furnace. It is obvious that this can be achieved by using small particles that have a large surface area. So if we mix fuel particles with heat transfer particles, that are inert to the high temperatures, we can create a situation where the fuel is in intimate contact with heat and because of the small particle size of the fuel, it can combust fully. This is achieved in a fluidized bed furnace. Bed refers to the hot surface that is in contact with the fuel and fluidized means that the surface is split up into small particles that behave fluid-like. What one has is a structure like this. The fuel is being fed in here in small particles and in addition inert particles made from some heat resistance material like aluminum oxide are being circulated in this uh, furnace. There is a cyclone that takes these particles out of the exhaust fumes and puts them back into the furnace where the uh, fuel comes in. And so what we generate in here is a mixture between fuel particles and hot inert particles that transfer the heat to the fuel to pyrolyze it and to start the combustion process. There's even an additional benefit to this process. If these particles are made from a material that can absorb sulfur, 
one can actually effectively remove sulfur contamination from the exhaust gases of such furnaces. Biomass power plants are less efficient than fossil fuel based power plants. The reason for that is the variability of the fuel quality and its composition. Depending on the season, depending on the moisture content, etc., fuel behaves different and this makes it difficult to optimize the plant design. The reality is that the conversion efficiency of modern biomass power plants based on direct combustion is only about 20 to 25 percent, which compares to coal plants that are approaching 60 percent for very modern designs. The consequence of this is that biomass power plants are usually used in niche areas where practical where the fuel is available for free. Examples are municipal waste incineration, cogeneration uh, in wood or paper processing plants, in agriculture, on farms and so forth. But it does not seem to make much sense to grow biomass specifically for such power plants. The second thermochemical conversion method for biomass that I want to discuss is gasification. The combustion process that we just discussed is the extreme case of gasification. In a furnace, we try to get enough oxygen in contact with the biofuel that we get complete combustion. That means that the reaction products are only carbon dioxide and water. Now in a gasification reactor, we limit the supply of oxygen, so we create substoichiometric conditions. Because of that, we get incomplete combustion, which results in flue gases that still contain combustible components. If done right, a gasification reactor outputs mainly hydrogen, carbon monoxide and some methane. The advantage of this process is that these gaseous components can be used as syngas in standard gas turbines and combustion engines. Here you see the schematic design of a gasification reactor. It's an updraft gasifier. The design is simple. We have a drum and a grid. The fuel, the biomass, is being filled in above the grid. The next step is to start combustion in the bottom zone. This is enabled by a controlled airflow that goes into this reactor. So with the airflow we can adjust the temperature and the rate of combustion in this combustion zone. The heat that's generated in the combustion zone then drives chemical reactions in the three temperature zones above. In the reduction zone some of the carbon dioxide and the water that comes out of the combustion zone as reaction products is being reduced to carbon monoxide and water simply by reacting with carbon that is available in the reduction zone. The zone above the reduction zone is the pyrolysis zone. In the pyrolysis zone the fuel is evaporated and cracked into small gaseous components. Finally the top zone, that is the drying zone, where water is being removed from the biomass. This works best if the airflow is limited to about 20 to 30 percent of the complete combustion level. Then we get a typical gas composition at the output of this reactor that is 36 percent hydrogen and 44 percent carbon monoxide. It's obvious that this process is energy lossy because we have to use the heat that is generated down here in the combustion zone in order to process the biofuel above into gaseous components. This graph shows the exergy contained in the reaction products that come out of the gasification reactor depending on the amount of oxygen that is fed into the reactor. Now let's discuss first exergy. Exergy is the maximum work that can be generated from an amount of energy. So what does this mean? If you consider the heat engine that we discussed in the energy basics segment, there we learned that a heat engine always has a hot reservoir where we take a certain amount of energy, Q, heat, and put it into the engine and then we get a certain amount of work out of the engine and we dispense 
a certain amount of heat into the cold reservoir, the environment typically. Depending on the temperature difference, this process works at different efficiencies. When the temperature differential is large, then we can increase the amount of work that we can get out of the heat energy that we put into the engine. A certain amount of heat Q at a high temperature therefore has a higher exergy than the same amount of heat at a lower temperature because with a lower temperature heat source we cannot generate work as efficiently as we can with the higher temperature source. So you can think of exergy as an energy quantity that is weighed by its quality. Okay back to this graph. So in the graph we plot here now the exergy over the oxygen content in the reactor. These numbers here, they are relative to the oxygen amount that would cause complete combustion. That would be at one. So 0.2 would mean we only have 20% of the oxygen in there that would be needed for complete combustion. Now the curves in the graph, the uh, line at the top is the exergy that's in the wood. That's essentially the work that we could get out of the wood if we would just burn it, create, generate heat and then use a perfect heat engine. The other curves are the exergy that's in the reaction products that come out of the gasification reactor. Now we have the gas that's coming out of the reactor and of course the gas has a certain chemical energy in it that is essentially the percentage of still combustible gases that are in there. And then we also have heat in the gas. Of course the gas is at some elevated temperature as it comes out of the reactor. These are these two curves. The, the heat in the gas is the green curve and the blue curve that is the chemical energy that's in the gas. So if we wanted to optimize the amount of still combustible gas that we have in the output of the reactor, we would set the oxygen intake to about 25% of the oxygen amount that we would have to put in for complete combustion. That would give us a maximum of uncombusted gas that we then could store and use in a gas turbine later on, and we would get a relative minimal amount of heat in this gas. If we would go to higher temperatures, the gas would get hotter at the output of the reactor, but the chemical energy in the gas would go down, so we would have higher components of carbon dioxide and water instead of carbon monoxide and hydrogen in the gas that's coming out of the reactor. If we go to the end of this scale, that is of course the situation that we have in a furnace where we try to completely combust all the fuel and just make heat as much as we can. If we go to lower temperatures, an additional component occurs. This is char, charcoal, pure solid carbon particles. So if we wanted to make charcoal, then we would have a very low oxygen content in the reactor. This is essentially what you would get if you go to Home Depot and buy a sack of charcoal. Now it's interesting to look at the total exergy that's in the gas. So that is the blue and the green curve added up. That gives us the brown curve, total gas exergy. And we see here that the exergy in the gas that's coming out of the reactor is going down as the, as the oxygen amount increases in the gas that we feed in. Now the difference between this curve and the exergy line of the fuel, that is the exergy loss in this process. So this is essentially the price that we are paying for turning this inconvenient biofuel into a standardized gas or heat that we can directly use in engines and industrial processes. So as usual, whenever we convert energy from one form into another, we always suffer a loss of energy to the environment, which is not recoverable. This graph compares the conversion efficiencies of different biofuels when they are converted to syngas. So we assume here that we have a perfect reactor that makes the maximum amount of syngas out of the uh, fuel that is put into it. So we are at this maximum of the chemical exergy curve. So here we have the efficiency and this here are the different fuels. 
Now the three different types of bars, they are different in that the black bar compares the amount of lower heating value in the syngas compared to the lower heating value of the fuel that was put into the reactor, while the two other bars, they compare chemical and chemical and physical exergy. So in the white bar we add the two and the gray bar is just a chemical exergy. So the gray bar is perhaps the most important one if you think of making syngas as your main objective. So the biofuels are compared with coal which is on the left. Coal can achieve a lower heating value of about 85% in the syngas compared to the lower heating value of the coal that was initially put into the reactor. Lower heating value is just a standardized way of assessing how much heat is coming out of a certain fuel when it is completely combusted in a furnace. So it seems that most biofuels, except those that contain a lot of water, sludge and manure, achieve similar efficiencies when it comes to the lower heating value. But there is a clear trend downwards depending on the water content when it comes to the efficiency at which syngas can be produced. So we just learned that gasification leads to loss of energy or exergy. So why are we bothering with this process? Well, the main disadvantage of biomass is that it's not consistent. We have many different types and depending on the season and the weather, they have different water contents and different combustion properties. That makes it very difficult to build power plants that directly run on this fuel. So if we convert it to a standardized fuel, this syngas, which, con which contains mostly hydrogen and carbon monoxide, then we can build power plants or combustion engines that are optimized for this gas and we get maximum performance out of them. Furthermore, the energy loss encountered during the gasification is often partly compensated by a much more efficient performance of the heat engines that use the syngas. Other advantages are that gas can be transported in pipelines and also that once one has the syngas, one can use the fischer troche reaction and use that hydrogen and carbon monoxide to make a variety of longer chain hydrocarbons that are liquid. So one can essentially make things like gasoline or diesel from syngas. Another interesting aspect is that hydrogen can be used directly in fuel cells to make electricity. The third thermochemical conversion process is liquefaction. The most prominent method is the fischer troche process. The fischer troche process was developed in 1925 and it converts carbon monoxide and hydrogen into longer chain hydrocarbons. This is achieved by putting these two gases in contact with a catalyst at elevated temperatures and pressures and hydrocarbon chains are formed. By controlling the pressure and the temperature, one can dial in a certain hydrocarbon chain length. This is again an exothermic process, so energy is lost in this conversion process. Here's a schematic of a typical fischer troche reactor. Essentially it is a vessel that is outfitted with a bundle of catalyst coated tubes. The gas is being put into this at a certain pressure and the temperature of the catalyst is controlled with a cooling liquid that allows to dial in that specific temperature that leads to a certain hydrocarbon composition. And down here we have the outputs of the reaction products. This graph shows the output of the fischer troche process depending on the process temperature. So on the x-axis we have the probability of chain growth and this is directly connected to the temperature of the process. So on this end where the chains grow short that is the higher temperature end of the catalyst and on the other end this is the lower temperature end where we get long chains. And so you see here depending on the temperature if we go to a higher temperature we get mostly methane, ethane, propane out of it and if we go to lower temperatures then we can tune it between gasoline or diesel or even wax so we can even get something solid out of this process. 
Here you see a few hydrocarbon chains that are commonly used. So gasoline is about eight, diesel is maybe 14 or so, motor oil 25. And so you see that once you have the syngas, you can basically make all these commonly used fuels. And that is of course very convenient because we can just continue using the equipment that we have already. The only drawback is of course that this process costs energy again and so less and less is remaining from the initial biofuel that was put into the uh, conversion processes. This figure shows the efficiency of synthetic fuel production using the fischer troche process. We start out here with the biomass that is fed into the process and then it is first dried and then we go into the gasifier and in the gasifier we take our first big hit in terms of energy loss. So the, the width of the gray bar is proportional to the energy that is still left in the fuel. So the big first hit is in the gasification. There we lose like 20-25% and then we have several other processes in between that are necessary for the fischer troch process. Important is to build up the pressure. So for this we actually feed in energy. This energy comes from the gases that come out of the fischer troch process. There's a generator that makes electricity with that gas. So we use that energy and feed it back in here. There is the water gas shift reaction. Fischer Troche works better if there is more hydrogen proportional to the carbon monoxide, and so there is a this, this water gas shift reaction that reacts carbon monoxide with water to carbon dioxide and hydrogen. Then we finally go into the Fischer Troche reactor, and after the Fischer Troche, we basically have our fuels and they go into a fractional distillation setup where we separate out the liquids and the gases. So as I just said, the gases are being used to make the electricity for the compressor. So what we're left with is the energy that's in the liquid. So this is really our next big hit uh, in, of the energy. And so if you compare now this little sliver of gray with this much thicker band of gray with which we go in, it is clear that a lot of energy has been lost during these repeat conversion processes. If everything goes well, we get about 34% of the energy in the feedstock in these liquids that come out of the fischer troche process. So far we talked about thermochemical conversion of biofeedstocks. The other method to go about this is biochemical conversion and here we use uh, natural bacteria to digest the feedstock into biogas. That's a complicated natural process where biomass is converted to methane and carbon dioxide under oxygen poor anaerobic conditions. There are four stages in this process. The first one is hydrolysis, where the bacteria splits the biomass polymers into monomers. Then we have acidogenesis, where monomers are converted into fatty acids. Then we have acetogenesis, where the fatty acids finally are converted into acetic acid, carbon dioxide and hydrogen. And then finally methane occurs when the acid is converted to methane and that's the uh, fuel that we want. This is the process that is typically used for municipal solid waste conversion in landfills. This here shows a landfill schematically. Essentially the uh, wastes are uh, trapped in an enclosed space. There are liners that prevent the uh, fluids from the wastes to enter the environment and we have a cap that prevents oxygen from entering the landfill. And that creates these anaerobic conditions that we need for the anaerobic digestion process. The gas is extracted with a piping system. There is this, this manifold all over the uh, landfill and the pipes go into a main line that transports the gas to the power plant. Here in this graph we see how the different volatile components evolve inside the landfill over time. So we have here the uh, time in years and this is the percentage by volume of the gas components. And so you see here that in the beginning we get other products than methane. Methane only starts occurring after about half to one year 
and then we'll reach some maximum after eight years or so and then the methane content uh, starts to decline. One can extract methane for a number of years from a landfill but the amount is not constant. I found an interesting case study about a landfill in Italy that was published in the Journal of Energy Conversion and Management. This landfill serves a town of 400,000 people and it contains uh, 1.5 million cubic meters of solid waste that corresponds to a surface area of about 500 by 500 meters. It's located on a slope and so the upper part was filled first and is the oldest part of the uh, landfill. The circles in this map of the landfill that corresponds to the wellheads that were implemented to collect the methane that's coming out of this landfill and this gas is then used in a combustion engine based generator. On these two graphs you see the uh, composition of each individual wellhead in this landfill. So each of the numbers corresponds to a wellhead. You see already that each of these wellheads has a distinctly different composition between methane, carbon dioxide and nitrogen. Now one can group the wellheads into wellheads that produce more than 40% methane and wellheads that produce less than 40% methane because when there is more than 40% it is suitable to be used in a combustion engine so we can use it in the uh, generator that generates electricity. If the composition is less than 40% methane then the gas is only good enough for burning and um, heating purposes. So you see from these graphs that the output of a landfill is highly heterogeneous and of course that complicates the use of this gas because each well needs to be characterized and controlled and the gas needs to be put to the appropriate use. It's interesting to put the output of this landfill in perspective with regard to the number of people that produce the waste that goes into this landfill. So the paper concludes that we have 7,240,000 cubic meters of high methane content gas, so that's the gas with the more than 40% methane that can be used in the generator. If one looks into the uh, lower heating value of the gas, we get about 39 gigawatt hours per year. If we assume 25% generation efficiency, which is reasonable for a combustion engine based generator, we get 10 gigawatt hours per year electricity. So if you divide that by the number of hours in a year you get 1.14 megawatt as generation capacity. So this is really tiny if you compare it with a major coal-fired power plant that has somewhere between 700 megawatt to 1 gigawatt. So this landfill serves 400,000 people. That means that about 2.9 watts per person are being generated by this generator. The amount of low methane content gas, so that's the gas with less than 40% that can be used for heating, that is a little bit more than half of the gas with the high methane content. Now since the methane content is lower in this gas in the first place, we arrive at 9.1 gigawatt hours per year heating energy. That corresponds to a heating power of about 1 megawatt. So this is similar to the electrical uh, power output, but this is of course a result of the 25% efficiency factor that needs to be applied to the electricity production here. When we directly combust it and benefit from the heat, we get to use all the energy that is coming out of the gas. It's interesting to compare this uh, heating power with the power that is actually being used for heating houses in the US. We learned earlier that the US used 29 uh, petawatt hours of energy per year and 6.7% of that are used for space heating. So if we zoom 300 million residents that corresponds to each person needing about 6.5 megawatt hours per year for heating. If we divide the 9.1 gigawatt hour per year energy output of the landfill by this 6.5 megawatt hour estimate, we arrive at about 1400 people that could fulfill their heating needs with this gas. If we zoom four people to a house, that would cover about 350 residential houses or maybe 
0.35% of the 100,000 houses that would be inhabited by the 400,000 people. So you see again that only a small number of the people that produce the waste would actually gain enough energy to cover their heating needs here. The bottom line, perhaps, of this comparison is that municipal waste can only cover a very small amount of the energy that is needed by the population that produces the waste. Another interesting application of anaerobic digestion is in agricultural settings where wastes and manure can be turned to biogas with this process. Here you see a schematic of the uh, most popular type of system that is in use right now in the US. It's the so-called plug flow digester. The advantage of the system is that it's continuous so one can put the fresh uh, manure and wastes in on one side. One can extract the digested waste on the other end and this can still be used as fertilizer replacement. So so this is another energy benefit of this technology. In the US there are currently 113 of these systems in operation. They produce 28 megawatt combined. That's a small number but it is estimated that the US could supply about 2000 of such systems with waste. That would mean one could produce about 400 megawatts which is equivalent to one of the smaller coal-fired power plants. One interesting item to note is that these digesters must be heated to biological temperatures. That means that in winter one needs to heat them more so the energy return is lower. So we only get 1 to 1.7 in winter and in summer it is uh, 1 to 3.3. Uh, this concludes part 1 of the bioenergy segment. Thanks for watching.